brought to you almost live from the dude in the basement studios. Why? Because that's where the good stuff is. It sips, suds, and smokes with your smoking host, the good old boys. Suds, suds, suds. It's time for more suds. Hey, welcome everyone to this suds episode where everything good in life is worth discussing. Today's hosts include myself, good old gal Juliana, and next to me is good old boy Dave. Hey, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> A silent good old gal, bitey scratchy. Does that come with a carry permit? <laughs> <laughs> possibly, possibly. And also with us today is good old boy Mike. Hello. Really? Well, you know, he's starting. There could be a lot more verbose about it. Wow. He's building huh. up to it. I think you need another beer, dude. Uh, probably yes. <laughs> and good old boy Kendall. Thrilled as always. Hi, Yay. everybody. And we are the best thing at on at 2 a.m. And we thank you for joining us today instead of baby talk, discussing the importance of baby teeth. Yeah, I think those I think kids. That last baby was dying. <laughs> it's a real show, people. That's all I got to say. They talk about baby teeth for an hour. <laughs> wow, that's really scary. Really, really scary. Kendall also has a blog you'll hear more about at the end of the show today called Beer Makes Three. Really great blog, guys. You need to check it out. Anyways, our sud segments are about beer, 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 and more beer. And definitely no baby talk. It's an hour episode that is mildly entertaining for 20 minutes. Maybe. Dave, do you think it could be entertaining for at least 18 of the 22 minutes? I got your back, dude. <laughs> I'll make something up. <laughs> Give me some more beer. We're going to dish it off to the cat. Yeah. <laughs> we have the studio cat here with us today. <laughs> she seems disinterested already. <laughs> she did perk up with the baby talk Itchy, thing, scratchy. Bitey scratchy. <laughs> Bitey scratchy. Bitey scratchy. Or as, or as it's known to another relative, is itchy bitchy. Yes. Okay, itchy, good. Itchy. Yes. I knew I'd screw that up. <laughs> Go ahead, Dave. Bust me. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> little itchy bitchy. I, I knew I'd screw it up. Oh, our poor little buddy. Well, mm. anyways, um, today's show I'm really, really excited about. Um, it's going to be about sour beer, of course, with mm. lots of special guests. Pucker um, up, baby. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, this is part of a series um, on discussing sour beers in regional areas. This style of beer tends to be made in small quantities with lots of love and doesn't always enjoy a broad range of distribution. So not white whale status because you can find Eat these... the holy grail! <laughs> that too. Uh, many of our mail order partners have these in stock if you can't find them locally. And mail they, order partner? Is that kind of like a mail order <laughs> <laughs> You know. Dave, that's a whole new part of the internet just for you, man. <laughs> Russian Brides. That's another show at 2 a.m. Yeah, it's great. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well. I, I keep on getting this confused between sour beers in a regional area. And regional areas that are sour. Because I kept on thinking it's like <laughs> Wyoming. <laughs> or some parts of Canada that just, frankly, are really sour. It sounds know, almost so. like a medical show. You're, you've are you got regional areas that I are I think the souring. cat could probably make that show entertaining. Uh, oh, <laughs> believe me, she can. Yes, she can. Well, this episode is going to cover sours of the Midwest. From Upland in Bloomington, Indiana... Hey. Not Canada. No. Um, New Glarus in New Glarus, Wisconsin. <whistles> exactly. Getting close. And Jolly Pumpkin in Dexter, Michigan. Yay. What? No, go blue? Go blue. <laughs> I was just waiting, man. 
Yeah, whoa, they are, they whoa, are right whoa, outside whoa. of Ann Arbor. <laughs> yeah, whoa. but whoa, 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 now whoa. The, this region has just gotten sour. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Next, you're going to say the dominating Big Ten, and I'm going to have to get a bucket. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Speaking of dominating Big Ten, oh, Jesus. Oh, happiness man. to Michigan State. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. La, la, la. Here comes a fist fight. Exactly. At the table. It's coming. I'm wearing green, man. It's coming. I can drink my way to get through this. <sighs> Whatever. Okay. So, the beers that we are going to discuss today are from Upland is the Persimmon Lambic and the Sour Reserve. Yay. Yay. Oh, I thought you were pressing a button. Uh, I was trying to. <laughs> <laughs> God. Thinking about it. I guess he is. Um, from New Glarus is the raspberry tart and the strawberry rhubarb. <laughs> there you go. And from Jolly Pumpkin is the beer de Mars and the calabaza boreal. So, we have a new twist that each of the brewers will get to introduce their own beers today. While we won't rate their mostly lame radio voices, we will be tasting and rating their beers. Thank God. Kendall gets the honors of going over our Suds ratings today. We'll be tasting and discussing these beers and rating them with these Suds ratings, plus our signature belching sounds. Here are those ratings now. One, that sucks. Give me anything but a bud. Two, was that a belch? I think that was a Canadian belch. Like 75%. <laughs> it's like a sour Canadian belt. Sounds like a dead Canadian. Getting <laughs> in with A. A. Number three. Ah, what a relief. <laughs> itchy, bitchy. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to you in a second, okay? Stop making that noise. That was a cat belch. Don't blame the cat. <laughs> and four. A body should really not make that sound. Uh, uh, uh. Tell your mother I did not make that sound. Now, see, you can't blame things on the cat. You have to blame it on your kids or somebody else. Oh, she is our kid. Yeah, Yeah. there you go. And five. Listen to that hang time. Give me another. No, that was the cat. That was definitely Canadian. It was a Canadian cat. (laughs) (laughs) They're the worst. (laughs) Or the best, depending on After how you look at it. After they've had sour beer, I'm sure any noise will make it. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Um, up first is Caleb Staten from Upland Brewery. Hi, this is uh, Caleb Staten. I'm the director of sour operations at the Upland Brewing Company. Um, really appreciate uh, you guys having us on uh, this program concerning sour ales in the Midwest. Um, being located in Bloomington, Indiana, um, we're kind of familiar with uh, the rolling hills of uh, uh, southern Indiana here, and uh, part of uh, what really started our sour ale program was uh, we have a pretty good sized uh, winery up the road from us, Oliver Winery. Um, so when we first ventured into brewing sour ales back in 2006, uh, we had a nice source uh, for some white oak barrels uh, that had previously been used to uh, age wine. Um, and over the years, we've grown the, the barrel fleet to uh, about 220 uh, individual oak barrels. And we also added a um, 75 hectoliter fooder um, back in uh, like 2008. Um, so we've, we've had a nice little steady uh pace with our program. Um, Originally we were always trying to kind of replicate the uh, sour beer flavor profiles that you would find in traditional uh, Belgian uh, Lambic and uh, uh, Flanders Red and Ode Bruin uh, styles. Um, And today we've definitely uh, slowly over the years learned our own uh, tricks and techniques um, and really are one of the uh, American sour breweries that uh, still has a lot to learn but uh, keeps uh, innovating as well so uh, the first beer that uh, we sent you guys is uh, Persona Um, this is kind of a fun fun beer especially on an American take on uh, sour ale Um, the base beer is very much uh, uh, brewed uh, in the nature of kind of Belgian style lambic brewing Um, it's got uh, a nice uh, you know amount of 
lactic acid, acidity, um, and maybe a polite hint of acetic acid. Um, and then that little base beer that's been uh, brewed and aged for at least eight months on the oak, um, at that point we then add fruit. So um, in the case of persimmon, this is all locally foraged fruit. We actually uh, pay a guy, uh, his name's Anthony, um, he uh, picks up uh, five gallon pails from us at the brewery and he goes out to his spots where he's uh, where he knows his trees are and uh, uh, whacks them with a sledgehammer or shakes them and uh, gets the persimmons harvested and then brings them back to the brewery so we add about three pounds per gallon uh, of persimmons to uh, um, an already kind of politely soured beer and uh, the result is uh, a beer really with that inherent uh, flavor and aroma of that fruit um, as well as a nice kind of uh, tart um, refreshing uh, complex to it so um, really it's kind of uh, uh, in some ways a taste of southern Indiana and what uh, American sour beers uh, uh, can do so uh, the second beer you guys have uh, is uh, sour reserve and this is batch number six so Sour Reserve is uh, uh, in the efforts to kind of replicate kind of a goose style beer. Um, so it's always been a blend of uh, uh, different batches of beer. And typically we try to blend three-year-old or older beer with a little bit of two-year and one-year-old beer. And uh, so this is again that kind of base Lambic style beer that we make. Um, and we try to pick uh, different barrels that are really the cream of the crop of our program uh, when we select Sour Reserve um, and try to try to have a little bit of contrasting uh, character as well. So uh, if we can find one that's kind of peachy and match it up with one that's a little more fruity, um, then, you, then you start to develop a little bit more layered um, uh, flavors. Um, and it kind of adds to the complexity of these beers, especially the long aging periods of that oldest beer. Um, so uh, selecting those blends, we, we can all sit down and blend certain proportions of our favorite barrels. And ultimately that ends up being um, the next version of Sour Reserve. So um, very fun uh, beer and one that we always break out. Um, and do a little vertical uh, batch one through six uh, every year when we do a, a, a secret barrel society dinner uh, up here in Bloomington. So um, that's pretty much uh, those two beers and uh, a little history of Upland's program. I uh, hope you guys uh, enjoy the beers and uh, maybe we'll see you guys down in Nashville when we uh, launch our uh, Yazoo Brewing Company collaboration beers. Um, we got a couple really fun uh, sour beers we made with Brandon. Um, ours is uh, three degrees north and his is three degrees south. Uh, reflecting our little positions on the globe and uh, uh, hopefully we get to try those with you guys. So uh, enjoy and cheers. Hey, so uh, Upland has actually come a long way in a uh, short period of time. You know, the recent expansion is actually going to allow them to expand distribution quite uh, substantially. I know that uh, Ohio is a major state of focus, and many of the neighboring states around Indiana um, are all uh, targeted regions for their expansion as well. Uh, so... I did run into Caleb at uh, <clears throat> the release of Three Degrees North. They did a collaboration brew with Yazoo Brewing. Um, mm -hmm. It's called Three Degrees, and there's a north and a south, uh, depending on. So for those of you that are geographically challenged, <coughs> uh, the north version is Uplands, and the south is Yazoo Brewings. Huh. So Tennessee's below <laughs> Most of the time. Weird. Here, Dave, give, give me your hand. I will write north and south on there just for you, buddy. I can't read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Uh, send those donations to Dave's Educational Fund at info at Uh So um, it was really nice to run into Caleb and, you know, actually thank him for both really great beers, you know, that he's made. Um, but... It was very interesting seeing the collaboration, you know, uh, go on. Uh, so we are going to review uh, the two beers that uh, Caleb talked about today. Um, but if you run into the collaboration 
for three degrees, you should you know check that out as well. Get it. Mm. Yum. <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about the persimmon first. Mm-hmm. I thought I'd give you my tasting notes. Um, first of all, Anthony, okay, <coughs> you are a great man because he is picking some fine persimmons for uh, this beer. Now, we had some interesting discussion he's about... Picking, exa- he's whacking. <laughs> exactly what is his title? Is he like chief whacker or is he the... The big whack. Well, it's funny that you should ask that because <laughs> previously, when he was the only whacker, he was just whacker. But now that they're expanding their distribution, it looks like Anthony's going to have to take on uh, a team, so he will become the chief whacker. The so chief whacker. Yeah. I wonder how you get that skill at Votech. It's like I want to learn how to be a whacker. Where's where do I learn how to do that? <laughs> Are you sure that's Votech? I think that's OJT. I agree. <clears throat> it's probably it's probably jail somehow. Yeah. Anyway. I don't well, know how to whack in juvie. Well, anyways. The- Andrew, we thank you for whacking on the persimmons. Anthony. <laughs> Anthony. Anthony, yes. Anthony, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Anthony. So We a- love you, the whacker. No. So <laughs> cheers to Anthony, because um, he's picking some really great persimmons. And then the extra shout out goes to Caleb, because... I, I'm telling you, this is like the the cleanest persimmon taste I think I have ever had in a beer. You know, let alone it being a sour. This is such a beautiful beer to me. Um, the aroma on it is oh my god, it's like it's heaven, and it's so clean, it's so crisp, it's got a really nice finish to it, and it's everything that I would want from a traditional lambic, but. You know, with this beautiful persimmon flavor. And I am giving this puppy a five. Five is not the time. Well, the thing I like most about this beer, aside from the fact that, you know, it is to me what a fruit lambic should be. It's it's a good, complex, sour beer uh, with a base body of wheat for the most part. Um, but it lends itself very well, as a lot of wheat beers do, to additional flavors. And I, and I haven't had persimmons since I was a kid, so this kind of takes me back to when I used to drink beer when I was a kid. I mean, um, eat persimmons when I was a kid. Uh, so, yeah. Um, anyways, so uh, I want to thank uh, the, the whacker for whacking the best persimmons he could whack. <laughs> Um, we're probably going to say that a lot during this uh, episode. So, um, this is the first hand whacked beer I've had. <laughs> um, and really, there's a whole marketing twist that that uh, they're they're losing there, aren't they? Upland's going to be like, we I sh- agreed to I'm do gonna what? I'm going to drop a note to Emily. I'm going to say you are missing a golden marketing yes. opportunity. Hand whacked from <laughs> hand whacked hand whacked persimmons. <laughs> We've heard of farm to barrel, so whack to barrel. (laughs) And we just killed Mike. So uh, I'll go along with Juliana, and I will also give this hand-whacked Jim a five. (laughs) All right, so the next beer we're going to talk about is the Sour Reserve. <clears throat> from Upland, and uh, here are a few of my tasting notes on Sour Reserve. You know, I wrote down, I thought it was kind of round, balanced. It's a really great blend. Mm-hmm. Um, so the blend that we have here today, he talked about a little bit on the clip. There's multiple blends that they have. We have blend number six. So each of these is different. And I have been to a tasting where I had like uh, three of the blends, you know, kind of all in one place, and they're not the same. They're they're close, you know. They all are a blonde sour, you know, usually of some kind. Yeah. Um, but it has a a nice dry finish around it. Um, I wrote down it was a little bit acidic, um, but it was not off putting at all. Um, this was a really great beer. My sedge rating for sour reverb, sour reverb. <laughs> Let me, whack, reverb. Oh, let me whack that out. <clears throat> the Sour Reserve blend number six is going to be a four. I like this beer a lot, too. Uh, uh, 
Somebody uh, should really not uh, make that Top over the belch. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. Kendall has the other review on this beer. Uh, I really enjoyed the beer, and even though there was no whack- whacking involved with it, there was definitely some <laughs> funking because uh, I really wow. liked the funk in this beer. And so the funkers did a great job of putting a lot of layers of funk in it. <laughs> wow. So I don't think I could say that again if you. If we I have had funkers I don't think you should. and whackers <laughs> in this episode. So that's how we should. Uh, are you a funker or a whacker yeah. at up <laughs> What's your job here? So it's not just Hoosiers anymore. It's Hoosiers, <laughs> Funkers, and Whackers. <laughs> got to be really careful. Really careful it. about this family beer show. But uh, <laughs> I just I enjoyed uh, the, the what they're doing with this and what the, the Brett's doing in there. Giving a, I get some of that classic barnyard horse blanket, but also some fruit in, in the flavor. I'm getting a little lemon, orange, apple, a lot of different things, and even a little oak from the barrels all this beer has been in. Really enjoyed it. I think it's a great American take on a goose, and I'm giving it a four. Mm. A four. Uh, Body uh, should really uh, not make that hang time. Sound. Yeah, whatever. Okay. We're going to take a brief break, and we will be back up next with New Glarus. Hey, welcome back, everyone. Up next is New Glarus, and here's a clip featuring Deb Carey. I'm an entrepreneur. I started my first business when I was 16 years old, and I met my husband, Dan, when we were both 23. What sets us apart from other breweries, I think, is our integrity and transparency. Because not only do Dan and I, uh, you know, we started the brewery, but we work here every day, and anybody can come through the brewery seven days a week year-round and get up close to the people who actually make the beer and see it being made, and that's very rare these days. We spend a lot of time contracting with farmers to grow specific varieties of barley and hops for us, not only here in the Midwest, but around the world. This year we'll do better than 100,000 barrels of beer. We only sell in the state of Wisconsin, which is quite unusual. We run two breweries. Both of them have fully functioning brew houses, uh, packaging lines, and fermentation cellars. When we had the opportunity to build this new facility, we tried to design in as much energy efficiencies as we could. As a matter of fact, we have so much energy efficiency in this brewery, we got a grant for $1.7 million for our savings. We generally try to play a little bit with the names, like Moon Man is named after one of our brewer's cats. Some of our names are things like Spotted Cow, Fat Squirrel, Dancing Man. Recently, we released Two Women, which is a nice lager beer. We have a lot of brewing awards that are pretty exciting stuff. You know, best international beer, best specialty beer, best small brewery in America, best mid-sized brewery in America. It takes a team, you know, to build a brewery. So really our focus is to take care of the people who work here every day. And, you know, it's just grown into what it is very organically. I'm not very interested in being big. I just really am interested in making the best beer in the world and taking care of all the people who work here. I've worked at New Glarus Brewing Company for four years. I like that it's close to where I grew up. Um, It's a small community and it's awesome that a business has done this well. Um, And getting free beer every month is a nice perk. I think it's important that people in America remember that it is manufacturing and small businesses that are the backbone of our country and that at the end of the day we cannot turn into a nation of service industries. We all need to have job skills and this is where the rubber meets the road in small businesses so I am really excited to be part of this. I like that theme which is uh Save America, brew beer. <laughs> exactly. there you go. Yeah. It's American. I'm gonna do my part. Okay, uh, the first beer we have from New Glarus is the Raspberry Tart, so I'm gonna read their description of it. Treat yourself to a rare delight. The voluminous raspberry bouquet will greet you. Mike's looking at me funny. I think I said that word wrong. Voluminous. Vol- voluminous. I, I I'm not that smart. Have another beer. <laughs> I, like, I like voluminous. Volum. <laughs> No. Bring over the chief whacker. 
<laughs> well, the raspberry bouquet will wow. greet you long before your lips touch the glass. Boy, that is true. Serve this Wisconsin framboise with very cold in a champagne flute. Then hold your glass to the light. Enjoy the jewel-like sparkle of this special ale. Oregon proudly shares their harvest of mouth-watering berries, which we ferment spontaneously in large oak vats. Then we employ Wisconsin farmed wheat and year-old Hallertau hops to round out the ex- extravaganza of flavor. And our second beer from them is the Strawberry Rhubarb, which is teased from the loam by the kiss of the sun. Mom's Strawberry Rhubarb delights are the happy memories of childhood. Diploma Master Brewer Dan employed sweet, juicy strawberries to tame the barbaric wild tart fermentation of rhubarb. Escaped from the far corners of the neighboring yards, local rhubarb was incorporated into the wild sour fermentation to create this drinkable dream, bright, sour, and effervescent. Oh, that was pretty. It almost sounds like Wisconsin. It's a beautiful <laughs> If there is such a thing. It's it's there. I've seen it. Mm. He's been there. He's been there in the effervescent uh, framboise. Twice. And the loams. So, uh, what I would like to talk about, if I may, is the raspberry tart. Um, this is the first New Glarus beer I ever had. And I think... As good as the others are, I think it's still my go-to. Um, I like framboise. I think this one is on the sweeter side of the style, definitely. But I think it is a, um, it is it is a it is a go-to for that style. I think it's something that hardcore beer nerds could like. But I think people who generally don't who say they don't like beer and especially don't like wild fermented beers could really enjoy this um drink it's heavy raspberry i mean it's if you don't like raspberries you might as well just get out right now i don't but you love this beer so stop crying um but um it's exactly what it sounds like raspberry tart it's like if you could drink the best raspberry heart that someone could bake for you um that's what this is and i love this beer and i give it a five i'm right there with you Dave. i love this beer it's been one of my favorites for a long time the raspberry is so rich and deep and it, it just reminds me of a nice raspberry jam on some warm toast it's, mm. it's just delicious it's creamy, it's rich, and it has a beautiful aroma. I mean, just a, as raspberry as you can get. And not only is it good on its own, this is one of my favorite blending beers. Oh. Blend this with some big, rich beers like Imperial Stouts, oh, and it yeah. really makes them fantastic. So it's a fun beer for blending, uh, but it's also delicious on its own. And I know I've given it to my sister, who's not a beer person, and she loved it. Nice. Uh, it's, it is a beer that's approachable uh, that you could give people who claim not to like beer. So I love this, too. Everything about it is delicious. Also giving it a five. All right. So with that hang time, and another. Julie, what do you want to talk about? Well, I would like to talk about the strawberry rhubarb. Mm. <laughs> oh, now we have your attention. Now he's all excited. <laughs> he's okay. Um, no, that was a cat. Oh. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> this beer, um, like the description says, takes me back to my childhood. My grandmother used to make strawberry rhubarb pie, and her pie, I think, was the best in the entire universe. And I could, you know, as soon as I hit the back door, I could tell when she was making this and I would like run to the kitchen and look for scraps because, well, I was little, so I probably got a lot of scraps and nothing else. Very scrappy. Yes, I was very scrappy, especially when it came to this pie. But that being said, this is a very approachable beer. I mean, this is tart, but this is not sour tart. And... The aroma of the strawberries, I mean, you feel like you're in a strawberry patch. And you've got, like, you know, the ripest, most succulent, yes, I said succulent, um, strawberries out there. 
and then you taste it and it's such a wonderful balance between the strawberries and the rhubarb i mean but the rhubarb is there and that's always an issue with me with beers that say that they have rhubarb in them is that you never taste the rhubarb but in this puppy you do and i i could wax poetic on it but i'm just going to give it a five Mm. Well, I wanted to uh, chat about the stro- strawberry rhubarb as well. It was very interesting how you opened up the story that it's a little bit of some shared childhood memories because I would say that not uh, the uh, world is not accustomed to know what a rhubarb is. It's a it's a fairly bitter root uh, vegetable, um, and it's usually combined with some sugar, but. That's the magic, is when you are combining a sweet fruit, uh, especially strawberry, tends to be the magic. And much like you, I grew up in summers in Ohio with rhubarb growing fresh in my grandmother's garden. Mm -hmm. And she would make it with fresh strawberries, usually that we would bring from Tennessee or she would Mm. buy locally. And so that flavor profile is kind of, you know, embedded in me as well. I guess the one thing is... Not all strawberry rhubarb pies are good. <laughs> um, but my grandmother's will take you down. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and mine Dang. as well. But I've, I've had some where the bitterness from the rhubarb kind of wasn't in, t- you know, sure. in check with the sweetness find the and balance. stuff. Yeah, and yeah, it wasn't balanced. So I just, the thing I love, love, love about this beer, I just love smelling it. I could yeah. just well, I could just sit so here good. and smell this beer all day long. It is just smells like wonderful strawberries. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you ever walked up to a you know produce counter and you know you're looking at the strawberries, do me a favor, pick up the basket and just put it next to your face and smell that. That's what this beer smells like. It just smells like a good basket of fresh strawberries. It just true. Yeah, <clears throat> I really love that. Um, I never thought that I would say that I have a favorite strawberry beer. I have a, fra- a favorite strawberry beer, and it's definitely the, the strawberry rhubarb. I love the softness of this, and if I had to compare it maybe to another beverage that you could relate to, it would be if you've ever had a, a strawberry smoothie, like with yogurt. Yeah, yeah. Um, it has the soft components where it takes a lot of those sharp edges of the strawberry kind of down, and you're kind of left with a kind of a middle profile of the strawberry fruit itself. That's kind of what you wind up with, you know, here uh, with the strawberry rhubarb. Um, still has a, a sweet finish, but it's all in this wonderful harmony and check. I really wish that I could remember the first time I had this beer because every time I've had it, I'm like, I'd be in a crowd of tasting 80 different things and I would walk away. And this would be the one thing that's hanging on me for hours on end. And I would go, man, I wish I had some more of that. Um, So it's really great uh, we were able to talk and introduce uh, Strawberry Rhubarb. My Suds rating for Strawberry Rhubarb from Nuclearis is a five. Ooh, listen to that hang time. Give me another. And on a brief side note about this beer. Okay. I love jam, I love jellies, I love preserves. And one thing I'm always trying to find is that perfect strawberry rhubarb jam. Mm, Okay? Good luck. Right. However, the color of this is the color of what those preserves are all about. And that's what, to me, makes it even more of a trifecta, is that it's not only, um, you know, sensory stimulating to me, but visually it's just, it's a stunning color, and it just takes me right back to all those memories. I and wonder if Deb has a chief rhubarb whacker. Uh, she might. <laughs> Somebody's got to whack that rhubarb. Put it in line. <laughs> I, I mean, really? But, um, I mean, you know, and you talk about, cu- um, you know, cult followings for different breweries, and certainly there's a big, you know, there's a big following for New Glarus, and it's worth the hype. Well, the thing that caught my attention with Deb's clip was um, what we've heard from a lot of people that are a lot of brewers, which is they don't want to grow in capacity. They really want to make great beer, and they want to take care of their employees. 
and that's it. And how many times have we heard that? That is just a very common approach within a lot of um, successful brewers that are resisting the urge to grow on capacity and yeah. having to balance that with quality. Well, I think especially mm-hmm. in in breweries like this where it's in a small community. <clears throat> you know, New Glarus is not a major mo- metropolitan area in Wisconsin. It's a small Swedish town. It's a tiny town. Tiny town. Very small. And, you know, and, and think about like uh, the Alchemist up in Vermont, Hetty Topper. They're, they feel the exact same way. So I think that small town, homegrown mentality, you know, whacking your own persimmons and, you know, smashing your own rhubarb, really, that's where it comes into play. Mm. Well, so there was one uh, quick story on New Glarus here before we take a quick break, um, is uh, that it's a fairly common story that I really love about New Glarus is one of their most famous beers. I think it's the Wisconsin Red. Let's see. It's the Serendipity, I'm sorry, was uh, that we did not talk about here today. A lot of people know that um, they really pride themselves on working with local ingredients at New Glarus. And that particular beer was really born out of a desperation of working with the drought conditions in Wisconsin. So Mm. the cherry crop was lost. And so... um, Dan ended up with just a whole bunch of other fruits, apples and um, cranberries and cherries and uh, what cherries he could find. And he really ended up having to, you know, deal with a situation where I had planned to go make beer A. I have ingredients to make a beer that I have never made before. And lo and behold, they ended up making serendipity. Um, it's delicious. And <clears throat> it has turned into just a fabulous beer, you know, in their lineup over in Norway. What a over, so. fitting name for a beer, you know. Just, yeah. Everything worked out perfectly with it. Okay, well, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be up next with Jolly Pumpkin. Welcome back, everyone, and thank you for choosing us instead of Baby Talk with Dawn. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, up next is going to be uh, the brewery Jolly Pumpkin uh, in, from Michigan and Ron Jeffries and his clip. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ron Jeffries, with Jolly Pumpkin Artisan Ales uh, in Dexter, Michigan. I was born in Michigan. I was born in the town that I live in now, Ann Arbor. I was born in a hospital that is no longer a hospital. It's a, it's a parking lot now, but it's next to a hospital, so that's uh, the same. Things stay the same. I have lived outside of Michigan. I have lived outside of Ann Arbor, so I have not been there my entire life, but I was born, grew up there, went to the University of Michigan, uh, moved away and, and came back because it's just a, a fantastic area, fantastic town. I decided to open my own brewery before I got into brewing professionally. I wanted to open a brewery. I didn't know anything about brewing. Um, I started studying brewing science, convinced somebody to hire me in a brewery. I had to work three jobs when I started working in a brewery because you don't get paid a lot of money uh, in the brewing industry. So I worked at a brew pub in Ann Arbor called Grizzly Peak. I opened one in Grand Rapids called Arena, one in Northville called uh, Bonfire. I worked at a microbrewery called Brew Bakers for a short period of time. Uh, all these things really prepared me for opening Jolly Pumpkin. They were very busy brew pubs. I got to brew lots of beer, different batches of beer, experiment with hops and malts and different yeast varieties, and really tune in to what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go in brewing. But all that time, I had the goal and the vision of one day opening my own brewery. So every place I worked, I worked as if it were my brewery. I put everything into it, everything into the beers I was designing, uh, training staff, whatever I was doing, 100% uh, is what I gave. And it really prepared me for opening my own own company. So Jolly Pumpkin, was it called Jolly Pumpkin from, from the beginning? No, not at all. That name came up came up quite a bit later. Uh, The styles of beer that we ended up doing came up quite a bit later. 
as we went through the early years of the craft beer movement and people moved from pale ales being out there to porters to stouts to IPAs and it really refined our vision of what we wanted to do as a company as I was brewing all these beers throughout the years for other companies and we could decide uh, and make an intelligent decision on how we wanted to proceed with Jolly Pumpkin. We formed as an LLC in 2003 towards the end of the year, September, and uh, started construction in Dexter, which is right down the road from Ann Arbor. That's what everybody asks, like, where's Dexter? It's, it's like right outside of Ann Arbor. We could bike to work if we wanted. It's about six miles. You could walk to work if you wanted. Uh, unfortunately, I'm usually in a rush, and I have a big truck that has to carry beer around a lot, so I don't get to do that very often. So we started construction January 2004, and by spring we were brewing beer, uh, selling it in the summertime and the fall of that year we took our first gold medal at the GABF it was uh, quite an honor so uh, the two Jolly Pumpkin beers we're going to discuss today are uh, Beer to Mars and Calabaza Boreal the Beer to Mars are you sure you're saying that right Dave? no sounds right to me but I what do I know? Sp- Spanish flair Calabaza Boreal <laughs> <laughs> They're all looking at me. Oh my God. Cut him off. <laughs> Try not to get banned. The hand gestures did it for me. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to get banned from uh, <laughs> where the hell it is you thought you were uh, in- impersonating. Wow. wow. Spain, you are not. <laughs> well, I mean, what kind of ethnic flair would you put on a name? Calabaza. Boreal. This is not Casa Bonita. Casa Bonita. Anywho. I'm sorry. Back to the beer. Wow. What? Usually it's me that derails us. So, <laughs> Beer de Mars takes half of its name from the beer's distinctive style, Beer de Garde. That is a strong uh, pale ale that originated in France, or as the beer's pirate-styled label, sorry, I'm trying to read here, uh, pronounces a French-style stock ale. Well, the French, le stock ale. The other <laughs> half of the name echoes the month in France when, uh, I'm not even trying to do that. <laughs> when this season is, seasonal is released, March being the months of lions, lambs, and ominous ales. Oh, no. Ides. <laughs> oh, the Ides of March. Oh, I just got that. That's cool. Uh, Beer de Mars, a tart <laughs> and almost bright aroma of sour fruit with Brett farmyard, barnyard funk that floats above the beer's dark, amber, cloudy color. Wow, that's really good. I don't know who wrote that. But hey, man. listen, kids. If you'd like to contribute to Dave's educational fund, send those donation dollars to info at sipsudsandsmokes.com. Care of really bad French lessons yeah. for Dave. 50% of every dollar goes to Mike learning how to do a Spanish accent. <laughs> now, the other beer is Calabaza Boreal. This is a collaboration dun, 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 beer dun, 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 dun. with Anchorage Brewing <laughs> that was made at Jolly Pumpkin. He who would fight with monsters should look to it that he himself does not become a monster. And when you gaze long into an abyss, that abyss also gazes into you. Nietzsche said that. So I said that right. Nietzsche. Very good, Dave. Uh, Here's a cookie. when (laughs) When introspection fails, it's time to look outward for inspiration, perhaps northward, One of the people who inspired me this past year is my friend Gabe Fletcher of Anchorage Brewing Company. We brewed this beer together. I hope it inspires you. Northward, warm regards, Ron. Calabaza Boreal is an ale brewed with grapefruit peel, juice, and peppercorns. It is a wild ale that is 7.8% ABV. Kendall, tell me what you thought about the beer Da Mars. I love the Beer de Mars, and I'm a person who really is a big fan of the Beer de Garde. It's not a very popular style, but I like pairing it with a lot of meals. And what this beer does is kind of take that style with its rich breadiness and kind of spice and pepperiness, and it cranks it up with a little bit of bread and funk and sour. And so I really enjoyed that. It has almost a very tannic, dry finish. 
Uh, the the sour is is there. It's not too sour. It's not puckering like a, a li- sucking on a lemon drop, but it is. It's funky and delicious, and this would pair well with many uh, meals too. And I really enjoyed it, giving it a four. Four. Why did she really not make that sound, Julie? Anna. <laughs> Uh, we. Oui. Hey, Dave. <laughs> uh, thanks. Hit us with some knowledge. Yeah, that's what. Well, I have no knowledge. Um, we. Oui. However, yeah, exactly, I have no knowledge. Um, but I do enjoy a good beer, and this is a very enjoyable beer. Talk about barnyard funk. This is barnyardy funk. This is. Did you say it's farmhouse, or is that farmhousey? Barn- is it barn house? What was the word? <laughs> I forgot. Barnyard, farm barn. We'll have to go back to the Subset and Smokes le- lexicon of made up words. Number 33 is barn housing. Barn house funk. Mm. Yes. Anyways, there is funk in the barn. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> <laughs> Someone has not cleaned the barn for a while and has got all funk. Bring in the chief whacker. <laughs> No, but it's it's so it's so good though. I, I mean, and the acidity on this is is just enough. But mm-hmm. for those that are looking for something a little, you know, different from a traditional sour, this is a great beer to try. And again, like Kendall was saying, you don't see a lot of beer to guards out there. I mean, I could think of like three off the top of my head, but you know, those that's covering a decent amount of you know territory within the u.s to even find that Mm -hmm. let alone trying to sour it a bit that blows my mind so you know kudos to jolly pumpkin for taking on a mm, i want to say like a rare style if that um and that being said it's God, can you imagine this with like you know with meats? I mean, yes. I oh can. my stars! <laughs> Ken was imagining that right now. No, I mean this is making me hungry for a big steak. Anyways, um, I really enjoy this beer, and I think for those that are getting into sour beers, this is a good little diversion from the normal lambic that you may be trying, um, and a really good style to approach. Anyways, I've given this beer a four. All right. Four. Uh, uh, Body should really not make that sound. So uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, Calabaza Boreal. Calabaza Boreal. Calabaza Boreal. I With feel the like there's a gestures. bull that's just about From to, you know. Casa Bonita. Yeah, no. <laughs> and her name is Body Scratchy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. So, uh... This is a very different beer, um, and I remember, um, you know, that when this collaboration came out, um, I was actually in Michigan at the time, the first time I had this beer, and I uh, thought it was kind of a strange, you know, collaboration to kind of put Anchorage Brewing, you know, together with Jolly Pumpkin. Um, it's just, um, they don't make beers that are similar to each other at all, you know, in the market, and uh I was kind of curious how this would go down. For the Calabaza Boreal, uh, the first thing that I uh, thought of is malty. Um, I thought that it had kind of a bitter, tart, you know, kind of feel to it, as well as a bitter finish to it. Um, <clears throat> the one ingredient uh, that stands out to me that never really quite came around is the grapefruit peel in this. It's like <laughs> it wants to be there, but it is not complimenting. I think mm. the beer very well. Um, the peppercorns, I never really kind of you know saw those coming around, but I don't know. For me, uh, this beer just never really fully came together. Um, this was not one of my favorite beers in the lineup. My such rating for Calabaza Boreal dun, 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 is a two. Oh, ooh, is that a belch? Wow. Well. I uh, liked it more than Mike did. I guess we can say that safely. <laughs> um, I do agree that some of the ingredients did not come around to me. I I started tasting peppercorns after I read that there were peppercorns in it. So I don't know if that was just a power of suggestion. I did get grapefruit in it a fair amount. I think I got some P 
pith, and that is pith with the th, not the. Uh, you know, I'm not. I don't have a lisp, so um, the, it was full of pith, pith and vinegar. Pithy. Yes, very we pithy. 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 Um, no, uh, I thought it was a pretty good beer. It was not one of my favorite Jolly Pumpkin beers. Uh, definitely not one of my favorite Anchorage beers either. But I think it it is something that uh, if you if you want to try, if you're in Michigan and you've never had a beer from Alaska, or if you're in Alaska and you've never had a beer from Michigan, if you can find it, try it. Uh, I think it's 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 a good effort out there. I would give this beer a four. And my body should really not make that sound. <clears throat> well, one of the uh, stories that uh, I thought was rather interesting around Jolly Pumpkin is uh, they really ran into some serious distribution relationship with Shelton Brothers, uh, you know, some time ago. And Shelton Brothers is a they are a, a, a super distributor. They cover multiple states and multiple countries as well big time most people tend to think at least here uh in the u.s tend to think of them as a major importer of beers bringing them into the u.s market but they also distribute um a lot of beers that are made on u.s soil as well <clears throat> aside from jolly pumpkin um our friends at blackberry farm that's their distributor is uh shelton brothers as well i'm sorry it's not well <laughs> i really blew that <laughs> sorry <laughs> <clears throat> that is not their distributor. Anyway, they do use a regional, a big regional distributor. My uh, my whole point of screwing this conversation up. <laughs> he told you all that to tell you this. Bring in the chief whacker. Uh, is uh, is um, I, there was really no point to this whole conversation. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just that it's a very delicate relationship that you have with your distributors, and they've fell into a period of time where it was kind of difficult to find a lot of their products outside of the Michigan market. And I really kind of wondered how all that was going to play out and, you know, if they were going to say, gee, you know, I don't know. I really don't know the full story behind it. I heard a lot of bits and pieces of it. I don't know what's true, and it's really not worthy of repeating here. All I have to say is I'm glad they're back in the market. They have a lot of really great beers to try, and I'm sure that we'll review some more on the show at some point in time in the future. So, <clears throat> yeah, great, great brewery. Great that beer. was a very good story. That was a good way of uh, you know backing my way out of panning. That was know. dumb, and I'm not going to do it again. I'm not. You're right, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> Wow. Well, great stuff, everyone. And that's going to wrap it up for today's Suds episode. We hope you enjoy this episode, and you can catch all of our episodes online, as well as on SoundCloud, TuneIn, Stitcher, YouTube, PRX, and Spreaker, our native media host. iTunes and our own Android app are the easiest ways to enjoy the show on your phone. Just search for Sip Suds Smokes on iTunes or in the Google Play Store. We love your feedback, and you can reach us online at info at sipsudsandsmokes.com. Our daily tasting notes are flowing out of Twitter every day at Smoke, and on our Facebook page, it's always buzzing with lots of great news. That too. Do us a favor and take the time to rate this episode if you like listening to us online. That's a big help to us, and we can get your feedback as well. We're trying to get better, folks. We really, really are trying to get better. <laughs> It's a process, Dave. <sighs> of course. Long, slow process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Kendall. Sorry, you yes. say something? I was going to say, hey, Kendall. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. Hey, hey, Kendall. Yo, Kendall. Hey, uh, tell us about your blog. Uh, my wife and I blog about the good news of good beer at beermakes3.com. We, can also, we also publish content on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at beermakes3. Well, thank you. Cool. Please check it out, guys. Well, I want to thank our co host today for joining us on this really cool episode. Good old boy, Dave. Keep whacking those persimmons, folks. <laughs> of course. Good old boy, Mike. Hey, come back. Join us once again and keep on sipping. Good old boy, Kendall. Great to be here. Always drink good beer, folks. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, everyone. And like. 
good old boy Mike said, keep on sipping. This has been a one tan hand production of Sip Suds and Smokes, a program devoted to the appreciation of some of the finer slices of life. From the dude in the basement studios, your host, the good old boys, will see you all next time.